In this lesson, we're going to do a high-level run-through of the audit process so that you get a feel for what an audit is and how it's conducted. The rest of the course will take a deeper look into each of these audit procedures. Let's pretend that our client is Lakeview Hotels. It's a small capitalization public company that operates a small portfolio of hotels across the country. And we work for early and young public accountants. Here's a bit of background. Lakeview has been a client for the past four years. The company has been negatively impacted by the slow recovery in the economy and its older properties. Two years ago, Lake, Lakeview outsourced the management of its hotels to an external manager. Lakeview's corporate staff are responsible for the oversight of the managers, the strategic decisions, the financing decisions, and of course preparing the public reporting. Lakeview CEO is a seasoned veteran of the hotel industry. The CFO has been with the company for the past three years and does not have a background in hotels. The company is faced with a significant maturity of a debenture. So with that background in mind, let's walk through the high-level audit process. Let's start with the end in mind. An audit is the expression of an independent opinion on the fairness of presentation of the financial statements as prepared by management. Two important points to make here. First of all, the responsibility for the preparation of the financial statements lies with management and not the auditors. And secondly, the auditors are responsible for their opinion, which is based on the evaluation of audit evidence they gather. So put in the simplest terms possible, an audit is intended to ensure that every number and every disclosure within the financial statements is valid and supported. So for instance, let's just flip to the statement of financial position, also known as the balance sheet. Management represents that there is $1,436,789 as of December 31st. As auditors, we need to gather evidence to support that this is in fact true. Think about this for a moment and consider the types of evidence you would expect the auditor to request to support this cash assertion. Here are some examples of the sorts of evidence you would have in mind. A bank reconciliation, a bank statement, talking to the bank about how much money is in the account as of December 31st, count the cash on hand. The idea is to gather what is called sufficient appropriate audit evidence to support management's representation that there is only $1,436,789 of cash on the balance sheet. The audit process and evidence gathering activity goes on and on for everything you see in the balance sheet until everything has been validated. That's auditing in a nutshell. However, as you can imagine, there's a bit more to it than that. Why? Well, first of all, and most importantly, you need to realize that we practically can't look at every single piece of evidence that exists. That would be cost prohibitive and in most cases is unnecessary for the users. So what the auditors do instead is they use a risk based approach to auditing. That is to say they identify where the greatest risk for a material misstatement exists and then focus their audit procedures to ensure one or more of these so called material misstatements does not exist. Notice I use the word material misstatement not just misstatement. Material implies a misstatement in the order of magnitude that it would change a user's decision when relying upon the financial statements. Now we're going to discuss this in much greater depth in a later lesson. So let's go back to the beginning once again and then go through the audit process step by step. The first thing we need to do as auditors of early in youth is to evaluate whether we want to continue as the auditors of Lakeview. If this was a new client, we would have to determine whether we want to accept the engagement. The things to consider include the risk to the firm of taking on the engagement. Generally, we don't want to get ourselves involved with any client that would expose us to a lawsuit. We should also be wary of the businesses that are under pressure or companies with a bad reputation as these would be the sorts of indicators of a high business risk. If it's a new engagement, we will communicate with the predecessor auditor to determine if there's anything we should be concerned about. 
Of course, we need to do our independence assessments by looking at the five threats to independence and the possible safeguards as we discussed in the previous lesson. We will document the parameters of the engagement in what is called an engagement letter, a fancy term that really means a contract between the audit firm and the client that covers the scope of services, our fees, and the deliverables. Assuming we are able to address all of these items satisfactorily, we can accept the engagement and move on to the actual planning. Audit planning encompasses a number of activities that are performed well ahead of the year end. Audits are very much tailored to the client's circumstances and no two audits are exactly alike. We begin with a risk assessment. A risk assessment requires an in-depth study of the client's business, the industry and the important factors that potentially impact the financial reporting. The outcome of this analysis is that the higher the risk, the more work we will likely have to perform before we get to that warm fuzzy feeling uh, about the financial statements management has prepared. Risk assessments require professional judgment and general business acumen. Clients that have weak businesses pose higher risk. Clients with weak people, processes or systems pose higher risk. Clients with strong incentives for manipulation of results through such things as bonus plans, covenant calculations, IPO aspirations or other such situations pose a higher risk. You begin to get the idea about the sorts of things you are looking for when you are evaluating the client uh, profile. The formal planning incorporates the client risk profile analysis into an assessment of what is called audit risk. Now audit risk is the risk that we issue an unqualified opinion or a clean opinion when in fact there are material misstatements contained within the financial statements. So in other words we get it wrong. We obviously want to minimize this risk to the extent possible under the cost benefit constraints. Note that you cannot eliminate audit risk, only minimize it. Pay careful attention to the language I'm using. Eliminating audit risk is not possible. We will look at this in much greater detail in a separate module. During planning, we also want to assess materiality. Materiality is a concept tied to users, though there is a correlation to audit risk. A misstatement that is material is one that would change a user's decision. For an investor, it would be a decision to say sell an investment rather than hold it. For a bank, it might be whether to lend funds to a company or take a pass. Determining on what is material also requires a high degree of professional judgment. What is material to an investor may be different than what is material to the bank. But once you know what materiality is, you can now focus your audit work on only those items which potentially have a material impact. Next, we need to consider our audit approach. And there are two general audit approaches that can be used in auditing. And let me just spend a moment giving you the quick version of this, and we'll look at it in detail later. A combined approach is one that relies in part on the strength of a client's existing internal controls to reduce the amount of audit evidence we have to collect. Now some clients spend a considerable amount of time and resources in establishing and maintaining internal controls. And where this exists, the auditors can rely on these controls. The second approach is called a substantive approach. And this approach does not rely on a client's system of internal controls and generally speaking requires the auditor to gather more evidence. Substantive evidence is collected to validate the amounts reported in the financial statements. For example, if our client reported that they had bought a new stove at one of the hotels, we would seek a purchase invoice to validate that the amount recorded reflected the amount spent and the nature of the item purchased. One of these two approaches will be used for all material balances or transaction cycles in a financial statement. A transaction cycle is simply a way of grouping like accounts in the financial statements for efficiency purposes. For instance, the sales cycle would include our room revenue, our accounts receivable, our cash receipts accounts, because all these accounts are related to how we collect record and aggregate sales transactions. There are other common cycles 
as well, including the purchase cycle, the payroll cycle, the capital asset cycle. So during the planning phase, we will need to document the internal controls and design our audit approach for each of these material cycles based on our risk assessments and materiality. Hopefully you get the idea that there's a lot of upfront work to do before we ever start actually auditing the client. Now, in the execution phases, we look at the actual procedures. The audit procedures are designed and documented in checklists called audit programs. An audit program is a list of evidence gathering activities that are given to junior audit staff to perform during field work. Now, field work most often happens on the client's premises as it requires access to the client's documents, records, and systems. As procedures are performed, evidence is gathered and filed, and the audit program is signed off to signify the procedure has been completed by the audit staff member. A combined audit approach requires that we test controls and gather substantive evidence. These two procedures are similar, but have different objectives. Now we already talked about what a substantive procedure is. A test of control is performed by looking at a documented control that we think is pretty important to the integrity of the client's financial reporting system. And if we can prove that that control has functioned as it's designed and effectively throughout the period, then we can reduce the amount of substantive evidence that we need to collect. Generally speaking, this is a more efficient approach for the auditors to take and one that is absolutely necessary for large, complex, multi-billion dollar companies. Next, we have substantive procedures. And they include analytical procedures, test of details, and account analysis. Analytical procedures are procedures that compare the balance reported against an expectation that the auditors establish. For example, we might project hotel revenue by looking at industry statistics and compare it to our own hotel revenue. And if the expected revenue and the actual revenue are close, then we have proven that that number is plausible. A test of detail is another substantive procedure that compares the balance reported to some supporting backup documentation. For example, if we want to audit the inventory balance, we would expect the client to give us a listing of all the items that are included in inventory. We would then prove that that inventory exists and is valued properly. Account analysis is a procedure that the auditor uses to scan all the accounts that make up a given amount on the financial statements to identify and investigate anything that looks odd. For example, we may scan the professional fees looking for fees that were paid to lawyers, which may indicate a potential lawsuit or a contingent liability. In the last step in the execution phase, we evaluate the audit evidence gathered by the field staff. The audit seniors will review the work of the audit juniors and the audit managers will review the work of the audit team and the partners will review the entire file. To the extent that the evidence supports the risk assessments and the client's version of what happened, we can move on to the reporting phase. However, oftentimes evidence is gathered that doesn't support what we expected during the planning phase and this will result in review notes that need to be cleared by the audit field staff. It could be that the internal controls aren't quite as effective as we thought, or that there are certain balances that are misstated or accounted for incorrectly. These sorts of findings require us to go back to our audit plan, reassess the audit risk, which in turn forces us to modify our procedures and gather more evidence in order for us to reach our warm, fuzzy, happy place. Some errors are found for which the client will have to make an adjustment to the financial statements. Smaller, immaterial errors may be tracked by the auditor, but no adjustment made. The final phase of the audit is the reporting phase. And during this phase, all final reviews and quality control procedures are completed to make sure that the file supports the overall opinion of the accounting firm. The auditors will communicate their findings to the audit committee and the senior management team. The audit report will be released and attached to the financial statements. An unqualified audit opinion means that the financial information management has prepared is fairly presented. If the auditors and management disagree on certain matters, or there are errors that management refuses to correct, or perhaps there are numbers which the auditors cannot find sufficient evidence to support, 
then the auditors will amend their audit report accordingly to alert the readers to the financial statements of such findings. I'm kind of tired just walking you through this whole eight step process. So hopefully you walk away understanding there's a lot of work that goes into an audit opinion. And even though the opinion itself is less than a page long, if you find that's a lot to remember, don't worry because we're really getting into a lot more depth in each of these steps in the lessons that follow. Now audits are cheap. Small micro audits will cost upwards of $5,000. A small capitalization uh, public company will often have an audit cost of $100,000 or more. Large capitalization companies will pay millions of dollars to have their annual audit done. Auditing is a very profitable business for public accounting firms and it provides wonderful training ground for new professionals. So until next time, don't stop to get to the top. When you get to the top, don't stop.